Buenos días a todos. Bueno, esta ponencia es de un estudio que hemos llevado a cabo desde 2013 hasta 2016 con el Laboratorio Soria Natural, al que quiero agradecer la colaboración, porque sin ellos económicamente era inviable. Este estudio, ¿a qué es debido? Pues en toda ponencia y curso, la pregunta típica de si daña o no la flora intestinal la hidroterapia de colon. Cansado de la pregunta, hice una propuesta al laboratorio y salió adelante con algunas modificaciones que os contaré luego. And I proposed it to this pharmaceutical company, Soria Natural, and I think it's an important study to ascertain whether it's beneficial or not, and then we can all reach our own conclusions, because sometimes it's an open question. Let's talk now about the intestinal flora and its metabolic and defensive and trophic function. The metabolic function, it's very important. It's important to understand that the, the to the second, we have about 800 grams of chemo and that we eliminate 100 to 200 and we absorb about 90% of our lives at the second. And if the fuel is not good, you can imagine what we are absorbing, our body is absorbing every day. Then we have these small quantities of lipids and proteins that are not absorbed by the small intestine and it will be absorbed by the large one. And what's also very important is the putrefaction activity of the bacteria that create this short chain acids. And all these compounds are synthesized by the flora and create acids such as the acetic or propionic acid. They are very important. Let me give you two examples. The butyric acid is the main source for the colon cell and the caliciform cell is eliminated the leucine so that we have no adherence and so that the fecal bolus is well formed. Then we have the enterocytes that is secreting water and sodium bicarbonate. Together these two cells Going, are going to create alkalinity, so there's not an excess of acidity in the bowel. And then we have the acetic and propionic acid that control the levels of cholesterol in the blood. Imagine when there is no gut flora, we have no fatty acids, and we have a new cycle of diseases that can create problems in five or six years. Imagine people, patients, who have this kind of problem for 10, 15 years. Fatty acids also absorb electrolytes and water. There is a big discharge, therefore, for the kidney. And then we have tyrosine, tryptophan, and others that create some toxin substances, such as histamine or chrysol, that are absorbed in small quantities that reach the liver. And then it goes to the kidney on or and, and the s uh, small, uh, sorry, the large intestine. And if it's not working properly and you don't go to the bathroom for one, two or three days, the poor liver is absorbing again those toxins. So it's an overload. So instead of having the organs working at a 50%, they're working much harder due to constipation. And what's first, the chicken or the egg? Well, I would ask, what's first, the constipation or a flora deficit? That's the question. Defensive functions. We have the barrier function that prevents the entry of pathogens in the large intestine. We have the biofilm on the mucus of millions of bacteria that work in a synergy that create an environment where no pathogens have room to live. And for that, we have colonics as a very important factor because it eliminates 20% of that biofilm, and that is a good moment to repopulate that flora. We also have a defensive function. If we have an optimum flora, then we have bactericines, which are a natural antibiotic. With a good level of flora, we have more bactericine and fewer pathogens. And we shouldn't be forgetting the lactic flora that are secreting lactic acid to reduce the pH. And we have more acidity. And for the pathogen, it will be difficult to 
reproduce itself and therefore we need an optimal level of flora. Then we have the trophic function, the interaction of the bacteria with the epithelium to regenerate the epithelium cells. This is very important because the enterocytes and the caliciforms, when they become old, when we have the stem cell, we, they are pushed by the daughter cells, the mother cells, then we have the daughter cells, and in the next bowel movement, the all cells are eliminated, and that helps with the regeneration of the daughter cells. And that's why it's so important that we cannot be eating all day long. If we are eating all day long, our cells are working in secretion and not in mobility. That's why it's important to have six hours of fasting so that cells can move towards the epithelium. What's also very important is to have hydro, uh, colon hydrotherapy after a period of fasting of eight hours because you will have many of these mother cells, all mother cells, and it will be easier to repopulate them with these uh, daughter cells. That's why we have today so many polyps and other digestive disorders because we're eating all day long and our digestive system cannot rest. And that's why colonics is so important. And we also have other therapies that are other important, but we will not be speaking about them now. And the bacteria that we find in our gut, we have resident bacteria, transient bacteria, and pathogenic bacteria. The resident bacteria live usually in the gut on a daily basis. For example, lactobacillus, all the lactic ones, and also prostridium enterococcus and at normal levels, they are necessary. You cannot say you have Achidisite coli. The Echerichia coli is necessary at a normal standard level controlled by the lactic ones because it synthesizes vitamin D and K. You can see, therefore, how important it is. So we have to be very careful when there are infections. That's because there is an overgrowth. Then we have transient bacteria. It's usually in the colon for just a few hours. Why? Because it doesn't have any room if the standard flora is well located, well placed. For example, it's the flora coming from, uh, and, and it is secreted through the physicians. For example, Enterobacter, Pseudonymus, Bacillus, Staphylococcus, and Streptococcus. And the enteropathogenic flora. And when we see that the transient flora is high in a test, you know that the standard flora is low because there is room for it, because they're all fighting for the same ground. And then we have the enteropathogenic um, um, flora, such as um, different bacteria that cause infections and lead us to go to the hospital. So this is a flora that really has no room in our gut. For example, Salmonella. Here we can see types of flora, saccharolytic flora and proteolytic flora. The design of the human body includes this type of flora, and it gives habitat to bacteria that need a certain temperature because they don't have the capacity to maintain by themselves this temperature. And we feed what's not digestible to some anaerobic bacteria. Very important. Then we have, as I said, the saccharolytic and the proteolytic flora. The saccharolytic goes up when we take a lot of fiber or non-digestible matter. The saccharolytic flora is fermenting the simple carbohydrates, and they produce these very important short-chain fatty acids. If we don't have this flora, then the problems start, because then we have no short-chain fatty acids. Lactobacillus would be the typical one, and that's very common in all probiotics. Then we have the proteolytic flora that degrade, degrade proteins, and 
that gives the characteristic smell of feces due to the ammonium, for example. And if it's very uh, stinky, it means that it's very high or that we have a very high protein um, food ingestion. The sacrolytic flora, sorry, the proteolytical flora, Echerichia coli, Proteus, Crypsilia, Crostidium, Seronoma, Enterobacter, and Citrobacter, i.e., the non lactic ones. The sacrolytic bacteria fermentation happens mainly on the right side of the colon, and depending on the type of food it displaces, whereas the proteolytic one is mainly in the descending colon, usually. But usually it's decompensated, imbalanced. That's why we have to ask our patients if they have gas, if their feces smell, and so on. The sacrolytic flora has a pH of 5.9. That's the primary part. And finally, the proteolytic one is 6.9, 6.6. We have here a view, it's a summary, it's a clear summary where you can see the saccharolysis and proteolysis processes. And it's worthless if you are giving probiotics without knowing what's going wrong. When there is an imbalance, a flora imbalance, we have dysbiosis, as we all know, we, based on different factors that is causing this dysbiosis. And when we find the focus for the dysbiosis, then we can solve it. We have different types of dysbiosis, some associated with putrefaction, with a flora deficit. For example, when we have an excess of putrefaction processes, these results are due to high protein and high fat diets. And we see an increase of the bacteroid population. And if these bacteria increase, other bacteria decrease, the lactic bacteria. And that's why we see a low level of lactic bacteria in high protein diets. And we see inflammatory diseases such as the irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease. And we also have dysbiosis associated with the um, putrefaction process and associated with the food intake. And they create the acetic lactic acid that are so important to have a good immune level. And then we have dysbiosis caused by a deficit that's due to stress and to a bad diet. And we have a reduction in quantity and in quality of the bacteria that produce this flora. And it's usually associated with antibiotics. When antibiotics are taken, we need 22 to 30 days to recover that flora through the use of probiotics. Hablar un poquito de los probióticos. A la pregunta de si son todos iguales. Pues tenemos diferentes tipos de probióticos hoy en día. Los propios alimenticios, como son el yogur, el chucrut, el nato, el miso, etc. También tenemos los probióticos en suplementos alimenticios, que encontramos en cualquier farmacia o el borario, y los medicamentos que es bajo prescripción. En diferentes farmacias. And then the amount, very important, the amount. It's not the same a million as 10 million. It depends on the pathology you have. You need more or you need less. And nowadays we have pro probiotics where we have more than a million, like uh, the rescue ones, the emergency ones. And very important, this is not asset so much. If you buy a good uh, probiotic, um, you don't know exactly which one it is. If it is a bad one, then you can have problems in the stomach. Maybe it, uh, the acids, the st stomachal acids, are going to destroy a big part of these uh, probiotics. Y también sobre las cepas, muy importante. Elegir el tipo de... Very important. You have to uh, decide and select the strain. If it is a marked strain, 
And then there's a lot of study behind it. But if you don't know that, then you don't know what kind of probiotic you are really administering. For example, Actobacillus rhamnosus. There are a lot of different subspecies. And on RR11, the most studied one, we know the positive reaction in the large intestine. And it can control E. coli in uh, the uh, female tracts. Uh, and if we have a rhamnosus uh, R12, then we don't know, because there are no studies uh, as evidence, what it is going to provoke exactly. This is a study I've liked a lot, and it stands out. This is the effect of yogurt in diarrhea associated with antibiotics. 2000 and he's trying to read it seven 2007 somebody has helped him in this study they proved that it was a sample of three different uh, uh, patients this enriched high protein or high dairy products 120 patients 40 percent with diarrhea with yogurt 118 patients 11% uh, diarrhea, and then with the probiotic yogurt, 7%, 131 patients. Then you say, okay, probiotics has helped a little bit, doesn't it? But it is a negative study. The conclusion is that probiotic in pathology, if it is associated with a diet, it has no sense because it does not reach the pathology. I prefer in the 7%, but well, everybody can have his own uh, opinion. In another study, they did the same with kefir. Exactly the same. This is from 2010. In the placebo group, 64 patients, 18% had diarrhea. But very remarkable here is that in the group with kefir, 61 patients, 22% with diarrhea. Here is the same. If the stomach acids is doing his work, then it doesn't reach the bowel flora. If there is a disease, you need a different diet different food. That's also a conclusion. This is the example I gave you before. You have Lactobacillus rhamnosus and the strain is R0011. It's important if you have your favorite strains, then you have to look for the probiotic. The important thing is to take into account the studies that give you the evidence. If you don't have the studies, you don't know what it is. It's just a Lactobacillus, but you don't know exactly what you are taking. Another study that was carried out Dr. King in 2010, clinical study of microbe genes, unique microbe genes in the bowel. All these uh, studies uh, are available, so if you uh, want to know where to find them, then come to me afterwards and we can talk about it. These are all acknowledged. Uh, the second one, uh, first bacteria, uh, fungi, the third one, and yeast, the virus, the fourth one, oranges, protozoas, and unknown. Unknown is the last one. Thousands of millions we don't know about, but can be cultivated. So this study gives us the idea that we have still many, many years of study in front of us. Years ahead, we will laugh about it, because then we will know how many of the new ones we have detected. Let's talk a little bit about the study we have carried out and the bacteria we have studied. We have differentiated due or according to resident, transient, fungi, virus, and protozoas. In the resident ones, you see the list, the E. coli, enterococcus, lactobacillus, bacteroids, prevotella, bifidobacterium, and clostridium. Uh, remember, this is the flora we normally, commonly all have in our bowel. The transient one is E. coli, but negative lactose results, Klebsiella pneumonia, Klebsiella oxytoca, Enterobacter cloci, Citrobacter freundi, Pseudomonas, Bacillus staphylococcus, and Streptococcus. Imported from those of you who don't know about biology, SP means all the uh, subspecies of one species. If there is no SP behind it, it's one specific uh, bacterium. Then, Enterobacillus. 
pathogenous flora. We have talked about it before. And if you know about this, then maybe you work in a hospital. Salmonella, all of them, Fibrio, Yersinia, and Campylobacter. Protozoals, you have the list, the ones we have analyzed, and uh, we are finding more and more protozoals in blood and in feces. Entamoeba histolytica, very common in the States. Entamoeba coli, Entamoeba harmani, Giardia lamblia, and we are finding more and more Giardia in Spain, the problem of Giardia, the Entamoeba fragilis, Chylomastis mesnili, Laudomoeba butchlai, Endolimax nana, homini, Blastocystis hominis. This is a parasite, hepatic normally, normally without symptoms, but it's damaging the liver more and more. So if you go to the doctor with a positive blastocystis, they won't prescribe anything remarkable. Cryptosporodium and Cyclospora and Isospora belly. Then the helminths, well, worms, to understand it all, nematodes, trematodes, and cystodes. Hongos y levaduras. And yeasts, all the candidas, uh, geotrichum, aspergillus, and mucor. If there are biologists here, then please forgive my pronunciation. And the last ones, we also analyzed virus, adenovirus and rotavirus, the same. Exactly. When you have these kind of virus, normally are in the hospital, no? because you have a disease that uh, uh, takes you to the hospital. What is the target of the study? I'm going to read it. It's monitorize and observe the, the intestinal microbiology before and after hydrotherapy to be able to assess the effect of this therapy on microbiology of the large intestine. That was my objective. Does it damage or not? Monitor and observe the ball microbiology after a certain period of time, 22 days of colon hydrotherapy, because sometimes this repopulation is stable with time. If you administer uh, probiotics, never less than 22 days to assess and to read on the effect it has, the therapy has on the microbiology of the large intestine on a longer period of time. Then also monitor, observe the bowel microbiology on probiotics uh, to see what kind of effect the probiotic uh, administration has on the microbiology of the large intestine. And then monitor, observe the opposite. I'm not a big fan of placebos, but I see that in all the studies it is almost compulsory. Then uh, to observe uh, this analytics without probiotics to see the effect it had on the bowel microbiology. And then to prove the for in analytically, empirically, for the first time that colon hydrotherapy is uh, really something that doesn't damage, it's innocuous, it doesn't damage the bowel flora. It is beneficial and also prove empirically, analytically, for the first time that after a certain time, we also have a positive effect on the bowel flora. And the first time I presented it to the medical community, it was before and after hydrotherapy. But the bio biologist said, if the therapy is really damaging, then you stop here. You have to think about that. What was the idea they gave me? Let's wait 22 days. Maybe the cleansing was so good that in 22 days, the body has regenerated by itself and the levels are better than before. That was the idea from the biologists and the doctors on the team. And I think that was very positive because otherwise if we hadn't done it, it would not have been such a good result. The protocol of uh, recruitment was very complex. The idea of the study was two years, to finish two years, but the protocol has been a barrier because to find a 100% healthy uh, participant is very difficult. And uh, then you are looking for the perfect uh, patient uh, because otherwise, uh, afterwards, they're not going to accept the results of your study. In this inclusion recruitment protocol, uh, has been very long. You will see it on our web page in different uh, languages, uh, completely cost-free. And it's very long, so I invite you to see it on the website. The protocol of exclusion of the recruitment. 
was based on different requirements, if he fulfills the requirements, but never, never it should be taken into account. So let's talk about this protocol of exclusion. Patients that were not valid between uh, not being between 20, 50 years. In the last two months, have, uh, re having received antibiotics, pro and prebiotics in the last two months. With one month was more than enough, but we exaggerated it for the study. Any kind of medical or drug treatment, pregnancy, hemorrhoids, fistulas in advanced stage, so that limits, limits us a lot, as you can see. Uh, acute uh, colon diseases, also acute colitis, uh, suspicion of uh, worse problems, and also hypertension, abdominal hernia, colon neoplasia, and also a cardiac syncopes, kidney insufficiency, cirrhosis, epilepsy, uh, severe psychologic, psychiatric diseases, severe anemia, and neurovegetative uh, diseases. We have to add also with the patients with high cholesterol analysis were excluded. So we really have screened very profound to have the perfect patient. We have needed almost two years to find the group of patients, much more than I expected in the beginning. Now, the sampling. Let's talk about that a little bit. I would like to explain a little bit how we prepared the study, the instructions. First of all, analysis before we started the treatment. Three days before, and three samples of feces. Three days. Why uh, different days and different moments of the day? That was to have a more balanced sampling of the flora. Uh, in our national health system, it would have been only once, because if you at that moment with only one feces test, you don't have a parasite, uh, then it, you, you cannot find the real pathology behind it. So that's why we thought it's more important in several days on several times of the day. It's very typical in certain diseases, the same with candida, a lot of protozoas also that you need to sample in different times of the day different days. After the tests, we, uh, we started the colon hydrotherapy. 30 minutes maximum session, 37, 39 degrees of the water, the whole therapy, one with cold water. All the therapies have been the same, being a good session or a bad session, working well or working a bit worse. Then the same process again, three days of sampling, total of five samples in the end. Then, after these five samples, after the laboratory, then we, the patient starts with supplement. Could be a probiotic or placebo during 22 days. After the 22 days, so day 23, tests again three days. Five samples in three days. Again, the same as before. We have screened a lot. We have been very careful to have almost a perfect recruitment of participants. Very important. The probiotic has glutamine. Very important when you give a probiotic, always glutamine included because it's the big uh, bowel mucose regenerator, vitamin B6, so that glutamine can be absorbed much better. And then inulin, which in this case helps us to be a prebiotic. If I understand uh, correctly, it's from a root. The probiotic is the functional fuel or food of the bacteria. Uh, uh, Lactobacillus, actus, these two uh, bacteria, H38132, uh, uh, HA132. The study is uh, very broad. And then these two, because we find it in mother milk, and which is the base of our nutrition when we are born. Part 
with the results. And here you have the list of bacteria. And here you see the evolution of the populations uh, during the hydrotherapy. E. coli increases a little bit. It has to do with uh, a typical reaction. Then enterococcus a bit down, and lactobacillus also a little bit of increase of the bacterioids, and bifidobacterium goes down. I want to insist, because maybe now you're thinking, I'm damaging. But we are talking about uh, 5 and to 18 percent. So I can assure you that nothing if we think about millions and millions. But it's important to say that the biofilm is affected a little bit, just a little bit, but it is affected by the hydrotherapy. Now we are going to uh, uh, focus on the two groups, placebo and probiotic. Placebo group, E. coli increases and all the rest goes down. Be careful here. We are now before the administration of supplement. Uh, this is, uh, again, the subdivision in two groups, so that you see the differences just with placebo, how it changes, how difficult it is to carry out these kind of studies. Our team has been working months and months and months, a lot of work, and we did it to see the difference also with placebo. Here, the evolution of the bacteria populations, the ones that have uh, received probiotic. Okay, before the supplement again. Here we see everything goes down and, and only one is increasing. Placebo and probiotic is of no consequence to me. It's just a subdivision, uh, just one other subdivision. This one is the important one. This one, the general one, the generic one. And here you can see that it is uh, decreasing a little bit. Vamos al final del todo el tratamiento. Now we go to the end of the treatment after a month and a half, more or less. Those who had placebo, we see that the reduction is maintained, quite maintained. It would have been interesting here to have a subsequent study a few months later because maybe it would have been maintained at this level. And there's something I'd like to highlight here. We mustn't forget that our society is always in deficit, so we shouldn't pay attention to this. However, with the probiotic, this is the big surprise. The strains that we provided, the lactic strains, increase tremendously, as you can see. Almost a 40% more than at the beginning. That's why it's very interesting to have a colonics therapy with a good probiotic supplement. Now, we're going to be looking at the different strains as we are short for time. I have focus on the five that give us more clinical data. E. coli, we see here the controls that start before starting the treatment after hydrotherapy and finally at a month and a half with probiotic supplements and with placebo. We see that in coli with probiotic, the levels are maintained up to normal. And the bacteria flora at the end goes back to the normal levels, which indicates that most bacteria will act in the same way. They will go back to the normal levels after some time has elapsed. And in the placebo group, it has decreased slightly, but it's very, very slight almost like legend. Now, enterococcus, we see here that in the probiotic group, there is quite a large increase, whereas in the placebo group, it is maintained almost the same. The difference is quite noticeable. We see how with the probiotics, we see a positive increase. Lactobacillus, this is the most renowned one. And lactobacillus has shown in the study that it's the most sensitive strain of the 55 strains that we analyze. This means that we always need to give at least a lactobacillus because it's the strain that is the most affected. And it's the one that's most common in the biofilm. That's also true. With the probiotics, it increases almost a 50%. This means that it's very positive. The patient had normal health symptoms because you know that we had a very strict screening. But after the treatment, that 
patient is going to feel even better if the patient follows a good diet and a good lifestyle to maintain these levels. However, in the placebo group, we see exactly the same level. Even after a month and a half, there has been a reduction of a 5-10%, almost negligible. However, we can see how patients here could have improved with a probiotics. Now, let's have a look at the bacteroids and prevotella. Statistically, we've put them together because they are exactly the same, statistically speaking. Funnily enough, in the probiotic group, we see a strong increase, and that's logical because the lactic strains have gone down. They are both fighting for the same ground. You know that lactobacillus is the most sensitive one. And with placebo, we see no difference. Those who have not received any probiotics will have no problems anyway. So there's no risk whatsoever. And when we look at the bifidobacterium, this is another lactic strain. And with the probiotics, there is an increase of 40%, not so much as with the lactobacillus, but it's quite good. And in the placebo group, we see once again exactly the same levels. That means that patients who have a colon hydrotherapy won't have any trouble with their gut flora in the sense that it won't be reduced, it won't be harmful for them. Let me read now the statistical discussion because it's very interesting and then everybody can draw their own conclusions. That discussion, in all the cases, we observed that after a hydrotherapy, there is a slight reduction of the UCFMs of all these species of the flora, gut flora, something that may seem normal. So if it eliminates some bacteria counts that are produced in the gut as a biofilm, and this fact shouldn't be considered negative because it can give way to new implantation areas for beneficial bacteria. And this decrease is greater in the placebo group because the group that took the treatment or the probiotic, the placebo is very uh, significant because the fructosaccharides have a competitive advantage over other species and a faster colonization. And with the strain, it's just easier. The conclusion of the study is the following. One can draw the following conclusion, that the combination of hydrotherapy plus a prebiotic and probiotic supplementation is a very effective therapy in the cases of dysbiosis. And in healthy patients, it's also good to have these supplements. And what's also very important is that it would be important to have new studies with a larger population with a homogeneous diet, and this would be necessary to support the benefits that have been shown by this study. And by way of conclusion, I would like to say that the damage of hydrotherapy is just 5%, and that's no damage at all, because if you don't eat properly one day, your flora will go down a 20 or 30%. Or if you take antibiotics, if you take antibiotics, your strains will be absolutely destroyed. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. A continuación, ahora procederemos a preguntas. We will now have time for Q&A. Please do tell us your name and where you come from when you ask a question. Se nos ha ido María López otra vez. Se nos ha ido. 
Muchas gracias, David. Oh, Has hecho un trabajo muy bien. Muchas gracias, David. Uh, David, your study is very, very interesting, and I think that will help us improve many, many things. At the end of your presentation, you have already given us some conclusions. I think it's interesting. I'm a nutritionist, and I think it's very interesting to know. Well, I suppose you haven't been able to do this because what you've already done is a lot, but maybe it's a future line of study. I don't know whether you have a thought about using autologous probiotics versus um, diet uh, probiotics in the sense whether you have been separating patients according to their type of diet, whether they're vegan or not, and so on and so forth, and whether you have monitored their diet and their lifestyle because there are studies that show that Prevotella, although you put it together with the bacteroids and to make it simpler to present the end results, Prevotella tends to grow in vegetarian patients. And there is some interesting literature on this data. And this can help us select better the probiotic that we will be giving our patients, because I do think it's worth giving probiotics, specific probiotics, depending on their needs. Uh, there were several questions in my single question. Yes, I've written them all down. Well, what you say about the nutrition of the selected patients is very important. We didn't change anything, and that was very important, because if we had changed anything in their diet or lifestyle, then we would have been manipulating their diet, the, da the data, I mean. None of them were uh, veg none of them were vegetarian, and if they were used to taking uh, yogurt every day, they should continue doing the same. If they were used to taking shukru every day, then they should have, they had to continue the same. And as I said, I'm sorry to say that there were no vegetarians. Nothing was changed in the diet, neither negatively nor positively. If they had bad habits, they continue to have these bad habits during the study. And if they had good habits, they continue to have these good habits during the study. And I've forgotten your next question. What was it? The second question. Oh, the Provotella question. We didn't study that. Well, we've been working on this study for four years. We need many more studies. And this is just a summary of the study. On the website, you will have um, further information. It's very detailed, in fact very comprehensive. Good morning. Thank you very much. And congratulations for your presentation and for your study. My name is Carmen. I come from Cartagena, Murcia, in Spain. And the glutamine doses, what was it? Can you tell me what it was exactly and whether you started giving the supplement at the first session or did you start giving the supplement after some hydrotherapy sessions and how many hydrotherapy sessions did you give? We only gave the supplements at the time of the supplement phase. When patients received their hydrotherapy. They hadn't taken any supplements. We did the test, the hydrotherapy, the test, then we give the supplement, then we did the test again. And we only gave supplements in the supplement phase. And now that you mentioned supplements, none of the patients took any supplements before the study. And that's not easy now and nowadays to find patients like this. And the dose, we had one gram of glutamine. And that's not enough for a patient who has disorders. The, the, a patient like this would need two grams or more to regenerate the mucus. If the mucus is um, atrophic or degenerated, we always need glutamine with vitamin B6 and vitamin A. If it's very trophic, then we need glutamine and vitamin C. That's the best synergy. We apologize, but we cannot translate if the microphone is not used in the room. Did you take into account any previous assessments to see if there was any leakage? No, but we did do a checkup and we established that all the patients were normal patients. All 
all the patients, almost all the patients were almost perfect, but we didn't have this leakage test because, well, we didn't have the budget for it. Good morning. My name is Maria Jose. I come from Alicante, Spain. And I think that every strain works in different part of the gut, for example, lactobacillus in the small intestine. Is there a list of where they work, each, where each strain works? Not, not today. That uh, would be tremendous work. If what you say is true, uh, we, we usually find the lactobacillus, for example, in the right column and the terminal ilium, but not as a strain. I have a chart with 100 something lactobacillus, and we believe that there are about 800 that haven't been classified because they cannot be cultured of lactobacillus, but it's true that the lactose tend to go to the right unless we have a severe dysbiosis, because if there is dysbiosis, there is an improper movement. And if there is dysbiosis, well, then we start seeing functional disorders in the gut when you see uh, feces with that are not uh, appropriate for the place they should be. I am Anna from Oviedo, and I wanted to ask you about the patients who have an excess of flora. To what extent is it appropriate to give them probiotics without a hydrotherapy when we have a hyperactivity of the flora, particularly in the small intestine, then we shouldn't be giving any probiotics. What I do then is give the patient a very strict diet. And then supplements. That's the only solution. Because if you give them probiotics, you're going to increase the bacterial population. It's usually the lactic ones. There's a lot of gas, a lot of bowel movement, and regurgitation. This is a clear symptom of a lot of fermentation. And when they take carbohydrates, they digest it very quickly and they go very quickly to the bathroom. So we have to be careful with patients that go four or five times a day to the bathroom. That means that there's a lot of fermentation. If it smells a lot, then the problem is putrefaction. It's from UK. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, two questions, please. Um, in the probiotic group, how long did you wait after stopping the supplementation before you took the samples? Was it one day, two days? And the second question, is there any evidence that the changes you saw are sustained for many weeks or many months? Well, for your first question, after finishing the probiotic supplement at 24 hours, we started taking the test. We only had a one-day margin. In, in real life, it would be four. And if we observed a sustained result, we weren't able to monitor that because we weren't able to continue with more tests because of the budget. I would have taken the test at two months, wouldn't you? Yes, at two months. So, uh, Jaume Garrit, de Catalunya. from Catalonia. And I would like to know whether you controlled the feces pH because the pH has to do 
with the fermentation and putrefaction process. Did you control that? Yes, because all these patients were very similar. We control them and we monitor them in all of them. If we had seen any strange changes in the test, then we would have uh, discarded that patient. In fact, two or three patients had to be discarded because they had a severe infection. One was blastophysis, the other one was severe candidiasis, and that was uh, affecting our study. And there was one that was giardia. So, as I said before, it was very difficult to get this population of patients. Are there any further questions well or if you like you can add if you have any further questions you can ask them afterwards directly to the speaker because we're a bit short for time and we'll end the Q&A session here thank you very much